All spoken languages are made up of distinct parts which combine to convey meaning. The smallest of these parts is the phoneme. A phoneme is a unit of speech which distinguishes words from one another. For example, in English, safe and save differ by one sound. Therefore, these two sounds, F and V, count as different phonemes in English. This isn't the case in all languages. In Old English, for example, F and V counted only as one phoneme. This is because both are present, but only in different situations, so there could never be a case where the sounds are used to differentiate two otherwise identical words. That is, there could never be a vir or a hafa. Sounds like these can be said to be in complementary distribution, and that they are allophones of one another. Words like safe and save are called minimal pairs, and they are often used to determine whether or not two sounds are phonemes or not. It is worth noting, however, that not all phonemes will have a contrastive minimal pair with all other phonemes. For example, there are no minimal pairs in English containing a contrast between H and ENG, because H never ends a syllable, and ENG always does. This does not mean that they are allophones of one another, even though they could be interpreted as being in complementary distribution. In cases like these, the fact that they are so different overrules this. A common thing people get confused about is the distinction between phonetics and phonology. Phonetics deals with the physical production and transcription of sounds, and pays little to no attention to the actual meanings conveyed by them. Phonology, on the other hand, looks at how specific sounds are grouped into phonemes and used to convey information. For example, English speakers interpret the K in king and the CK in duck to be exactly the same sound, and phonemically they are. However, when you use a phonetic transcription, you see a little H after the K in king. This shows aspiration, a little burst of air with the sound. If you hold your hand in front of your mouth and say a word like cake or pop, you should be able to feel the difference between the first and last sounds. While this difference is purely phonetic in English, other languages make the phonemic distinction as well, such as Ancient Greek, which has this minimal pair to demonstrate the distinction. Something you may have noticed over the past few examples is the usage of brackets. As a rule, a phonemic transcription will always use slashes to bound the pronunciation, while a phonetic one will use square brackets. Using this system allows linguists to include both phonetic and phonemic transcriptions in their work, without having to declare which it is every time they do so. It also means that as a reader, you can estimate how accurate the transcription is, as a pronunciation bounded in square brackets would be far more precise than one using slashes. A nice way I once saw it phrased, though I don't recall where, was the slashes of doubt and the brackets of confidence. Other topics covered by phonology include stress and intonation, phonotactics and other areas of prosody. I won't go into too much detail with these areas now, but I will give a quick overview of each. Stress is the property which makes some syllables feel heavier than others. For example, the English word rehydration carries stress on the third syllable. Stress is signified with a stress mark, a little dash you can see in this transcription. In some languages, the stress is predictable. In Old English, it's always initial, while in Cornish, it's always on the penult. In some languages, such as modern English, it's variable. Compare the locations of the stress in community and adjective. Sometimes stress can be phonemic. It distinguishes words. English occasionally does this, with pairs such as produce and produce. A few languages can be said to have no stress. The most notable example here is French. Intonation 
is the way a speaker's voice goes up and down in pitch as they speak. An example is how the voice rises at the end of a question, and although this isn't as noticeable in English as it is in, say, German or French, it is still present. Unlike phonemic tone, which is represented by a diacritic on the vowel, intonation is usually shown using an upwards or downwards arrow before the sequence it modifies. Phonotactics refers to the way words are structured. One thing it looks at is syllable structure. Every syllable in every language is generally composed of two main parts, the onset and the rhyme. The rhyme is further subdivided into nucleus and coda. Any syllable can be divided into these parts. If a syllable doesn't have a component, say the coda, it can be said to have a null coda. A syllable with a coda is closed, while those without are open. As you can see, English syllables get pretty complicated, so we can further analyse them in terms of individual phonemes. If we start with something a little simpler, we can look at the notation we use to denote these structures. This is the simplest structure, and it's used by Hawaiian, Maori and several other languages, particularly in East Asia and Oceania. The syllable structure of English is much more unwieldy than this, so the notation can be simplified using superscript numbers. Not just any combinations can exist, however. For example, bedlockant is definitely not an English syllable, even though it fits just fine within the structure already defined. This is because clusters such as K-N-T are not permitted within English, as they do not follow the language's sonority hierarchy. Other structures are often just not allowed, or not allowed in certain positions. For example, a DZ cluster is allowed in the coda, but not in the onset. That is, it appears in words like heads, but can't occur in something like zim. So far in this video, you've seen a lot of phonetic notation, so it's time to look at what it all means. All notation in this video has been done in the IPA, or International Phonetic Alphabet, the International Standard Notation, as set by the International Phonetic Association in 1886. It consists of just over a hundred symbols and 44 diacritics, with which it is possible to represent any sound which is reliably used as a phone in any spoken language in the world. You can think of it kind of like the periodic table of linguistics. It's composed of consonants, vowels, suprasegmentals, non-pulmonic consonants, diacritics and other symbols. To recap, suprasegmentals are units of prosody, and non-pulmonic consonants are consonants which do not rely on the lungs to produce airflow. Most English sounds are represented by the same symbol in IPA as they are in written English. M is represented by M, L by L, and Z by Z. However, there are also a lot of false friends for English natives. The sound we would represent with a Y is shown using a J, more properly known as Yod, while the IPA R actually represents a rolled or trilled R. The British English R is represented by an upside down lowercase r in the IPA. The vowels are actually very different between English and the IPA. Even of the five basic vowels written using A, E, I, O and U, two of them, E and O, do not appear in many varieties of English. The vowels of the variety I speak look something like this. Rather than e and or, I have e and or, which are pronounced more openly. They stay like this even in diphthongs, whereas in many other dialects, the e will become more closed when in an a diphthong. You may realise that there are potential issues when transcribing the sounds of a language in which speakers have great variation in their specific pronunciations of some sounds. 
The way we get around these issues is by setting a standard in the phonemic transcription. When transcribing the English A diphthong phonemically, we use a normal E. This standardisation helps prevent overcomplication and aids ease of typing. On sites like Wikipedia, it also helps prevent people with different accents trying to correct one another's pronunciation and provides a baseline upon which more specific pronunciation rules can be built from region to region. Another standard when writing English is the transcription of R as a normal R. Using the two standards described, here are phonetic transcriptions of the word Ray, one more typically British, one more typically Canadian, and a joint phonemic transcription. You can hopefully see the merit here in these standardisations. That should do it for this video. I'm aware I haven't gone into too much detail on a lot of topics, but hopefully I've given enough of an introduction that you can research any of the areas you want to know more about with a little more certainty. There will be links to sources and further reading in the description box of this video, so you can check those out if you want to. So, thank you for watching.